good. God is good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's all be seated. God is good. Let's be seated. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. All righty. So, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. This is, um, I've been looking forward to the day that I get to make this announcement. Uh, I prophesied about it about two years ago. But this, I do not want you to just take as prophecy. I want you to take as an announcement. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I am here today with great joy. And, and first of all, uh, Bennett and the guys, thank you so very much. I understand that you all have uh, to leave shortly, but I need you to give me about five minutes. After the next presentation, then you can exit the stage. Um, now, whoever is doing the uh, projection thing today, when the presentation comes on, can you show it on there? Because I want the band to be able to track along, if that is even possible. If it is possible to show it in the back, please do so as well. And so, about two years ago, and thank you, Holy Spirit, I was really longing while the worship was on to say thank you for coming. You see, I say that personally, and that's because there is a measure or a flavor of God's presence that is only available when two or three are gathered. You see, we all pray at home. We, we worship at home. And it's not because of the music here. It's not because of the carpet. And certainly not because of the air conditioning, because I know how some of you all feel about that. But it is, in fact, that when we come together, and I'm not just saying that because it feels like it. You know, the Bible says it is special. Oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You see, when we come together like this and there is oneness, you know that our unity in Christ is not based on uniformity. That's what the world does. The world wants everybody to be the same. We all just wake up and go to work and pay taxes the same and send our schools to school the same. You know, everything's just got to be the same because the more uniform we are, the easier it is for us to get in line and be controlled like a, like a zombie army. But in the body of Christ, our unity is not based on uniformity. But rather, our unity lies very much in our ability to understand the working of the love of God by the Holy Spirit. And that is what I'm beginning to see more here. And I am so delighted because it makes the presence of God so tangible. You know, the way God himself describes it, he says, when we dwell together in unity, it is like the oil of the anointing. And so what that means is that the presence of God becomes so tangible, it distills as oil that flows down the head of Aaron down to his beard, such that the stick in his hand that's been dead for so long comes back to life again. And so when we are in the presence of God, one of the things that we are supposed to do is to receive that life. And so if there is anything that has been dead in your life, anything that's become out of function, the oil of the anointing can lubricate every machine back to work and bring to life every dead stick. So when we come here in God's presence, Alan was reminding us, and I want to say it again, let us not just take it to be business as usual. Let us truly press in because the time is coming wherein there will be a lifting up in this place. And I believe it's a lifting up that will be mostly beneficial to the ones who are already springed knee. And I'm gonna say that, springed knee. And what that means is your knees have become like a spring, ready to take off. You see, to have a springed knee means to be ready, to be anticipatory, to have that expectation. And so wherever, wherever I find myself, y'all can ask these men when we're having the Monday morning men's call, I don't take it to be just one of those calls that we have to do to check the box that we're starting the week. I go in there with such an expectation. And every time the Lord speaks to us 
And so I want you to greet every meeting going forward with such an expectation because any moment now, we will have the tangible visitation of the angels. One of the things that has been brought to my attention, which I was reminded of very clearly while the worship was on today, is that the ones that I visited are about to visit us. If you remember about two years ago, maybe about 18 months ago, I was taken in the spirit and I was in the camp of the angels. I told you that I saw the number of them. I saw the, the lineup and, the, and it was innumerable. I couldn't see the end to the table, even though from the outside, I, it, the tent seemed to be about the size of this place. I could literally see the tents from the outside. But the moment I walked in, the table that they all sat on, I couldn't see the end of it. It was an innumerable company. And I remembered what Paul said. He said, the writer of Hebrews, he says, we have not come to a mount that might be touched. We have not come unto blackness, unto darkness, unto tempest. He says, but we have come to the company of innumerable angels. We have come to the assembly of just men made perfect. And when I was there and I remembered all those things, I felt greatly privileged and I also felt at home. Even though the ones that sat next to me didn't look like me. They were much bigger, much taller. I told you that some of their garments looked like they were alive. I was given insight into the threading of their garment and every thread had a life of its own. And yet I felt at home. And so I want to tell you if they're telling me that they are about to repay the visit, I want to be here when that happens and I hope that you are too. Praise God. Very quickly, Alan is going to come up, but before Alan comes up, okay, after Alan comes up, I'm going to tell you this. If I forget, remind me. I know the Holy Spirit will remind me. I want to tell you more about the angelic experience that I had while the worship was going on today. I'm bringing Alan up for about five minutes or maybe even less to give us a presentation. And the reason why it is very critical for us to pay attention to this particular presentation is because concerning the times that we are in, Jesus told us a particular posture to take and that posture is not just so that heaven can recognize that we have taken a posture. It is so that the posture can condition our attitude right. You know, sometimes your posture changes your attitude. No matter how confident you feel when your posture is like this, you will soon lose that confidence. Your posture has an ability to puncture your attitude. And so if you don't want to be deflated, what do you do? You lift your head up and you chest out. And that is what happens when Jesus said, when you see these things, look up. Why did Jesus ask us to look up? Because if we look down, we will be cast down. If we look down, we will be what? We will be downcast. And so Jesus says, look up, and then you will see that your redemption draws near. Otherwise, what you will see is gloom and doom. So he wants you to look up. And when you look up, you will begin to see things. There are so many things being shown to us. Have you heard this lately? Where in people on social media, your neighbors everywhere, people are asking, even your siblings, what is going on in the world? What is going on in the world? Because there is a lot going on, but we need to start to make sense of it. And thankfully, we have a seer that God has gifted to us in this house. You know, such an amazing gift of God. And he's going to share with us some of the things that he has seen while he was looking at the same thing that everybody saw on television. And majority did not even know what they were looking at. Alan, please come up. Praise the Lord. Oh, you're going to need this. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is the Lord's presentation. I have been privileged to carry it out. Uh, Hannah, if you'll help us with the first slide. You know, I declared over us that we shall see from the top down. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. We thank God for the prophet. You got to stay close to the man and woman of God. Hallelujah. So we know what we saw a uh, few short days ago. And I want to open this up by giving us this scripture. And I want you to place yourself in the shoes of the man in which this was revealed to, the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. 
and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Hallelujah. I want us to uh, think about what has been put out in front of us, what's constantly being put out in front of us. And even as the man of God ministered to us, there's so many on social platforms that are coming forth saying, hey, what's going on here? What's going on there? There's so much going on that don't feel right. These folk that haven't even been in the midst, at least that we know of, of believers like ourselves are picking up on it. We know the scriptures declare that eternity is written in the hearts of men. And so even those, they're picking up on something happening, something being revealed to us. I want to tell you that this recent game that was played was a display, was a sign unto us. On the first slide, we see here a star that was placed before us and under the influence of the blood of the saints, the martyrs, those that have gone on preaching the gospel. Now, I want to help us here. I want us to get our eyes off a man and really understand what the Lord is saying, what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. We see here that when this performance went forth, that if you were watching from beginning to end, the moment the cue went out, this one went under another influence, all right? And this is what the Lord was downloading to me. I want us to go to slide two. This will be a mix of slide two and three. I want us to really see Again, what the angels of the Lord are doing. They are displaying the signs before us. Revelation chapter 17, verse 4 reads, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Now you may say, where's the purple? Well, purple, you can't have purple without red. And so this is the primary color here, all right? The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of of her fornication. It reads here in the verse 19, verse 9 and 10, and we're going to break this slide down. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Now, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to stay in, in window of the of the camera. What we saw here was a display of the seven mountains within the firmament, all right, or the waters, okay? The waters are a representation of people, okay, of inhabitants, all right? And we see that there are seven mountains. Now, from this slide, you can't tell. But even as the Lord was dealing with us earlier, sometimes we just need the right perspective in order to interpret. What happened here was that they displayed unto us the revealing of the scarlet woman and the kings that had been placed upon those mountains, okay? Also above the inhabitants of the earth. You got to understand, nothing is ever, never too deep, okay? It's never too deep. So go ahead and deliver yourself from that now, okay? Because it's time for us to tap in. It's time for us to understand we can't be ignorant to what is happening in front of us because these are things that the enemy will do to try to accuse us. We reveal to your sons, oh God, what was happening. See, that's why we have to ask that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened by the Holy Spirit, that we be granted unto us or that the Lord grant unto us the ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. So we see this display here and as this was going on, the Lord was just dropping nuggets and nuggets and nuggets. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to get another uh, uh, angle here. Thank you, sis. Before us are the seven mountains. The green representing the inhabitants of the earth. This red platform is the beast. Now the scriptures say, I'm going to help us with this. Hallelujah. The scriptures say that there was a beast or that the beast had many abominable names. These people along this platform, 
each have a name. It was to represent the many names of the beasts that are abominable. Again, coming up out of the abyss, which is why it was laid there on the field. Now watch this. Seven platforms here representing the seven mountains. Now watch this. The scriptures say five have fallen. We see from five on. This is why the platform shifted the way they did. First off, in a pyramidal uh, structure to show us, look, this is the one we are displaying unto you. From five down have fallen, six, watch this, from the top, six is, and seven is still one yet to come. All right? This is what the Lord is revealing to us here. It reads, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. We were given the display of the woman up top first to show us where the woman has come in ranking or in positioning over the rest of those mountains. I want us to go on to slide four. The scriptures read, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have received no kingdom as of yet. Now, as we look at this slide, we see another display, the beasts below, the kings and the inhabitants all parading around the scarlet woman. If you saw this performance, every time that woman would make a move, all of those would respond in unison, okay? Showing the control, showing the, intoxi uh, the intoxication, okay, that the kings and inhabitants of the earth have fallen under her influence, all right? Now, we see this display, her being in the center, this marvel and worship as the scriptures read, but I want to help us with this because as I was seeing this, I said, Lord, you got to break down every bit of this. I said, okay, Lord, I've seen the mountains. I've seen the woman. I've seen the kings and the inhabitants. But Lord, where is the 10? The performance, okay. It reads, in chapter 17, verse 12, Revelation. The 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have received no kingdom as of yet. So I said, okay, Lord, where are they? I have not seen a representation of the 10 anywhere in this performance just yet. And then the Lord directed me to the date in which this performance was held on 2-12-2-3, all right? 2, 1, 2, 2, and 3 is 10, okay? These were the kings that have not received the kingdom as of yet, okay? That's why the number 10 was not as easily identifiable in the actual performance, okay? Because the scriptures read, they have not received the kingdom as of yet. Now, as this last sign, I won't say last, but as another nugget to this display. At the time of the performance, okay, Lord, okay, we're gonna get this. At the time of the performance, the woman we see here was roughly six months pregnant. <laughs> Watch this. At six months, that means you got about three months left. Family, even the prophet will help. I thank God for the man of God here. It was a sign unto us of who was putting out this display. The three months and the six that had been were a representation of the three sixes, which is the mark of those that are pushing this agenda. I have shared what I have been commissioned to share. Father, I give you praise. I'd like to welcome the man of God back up. Hallelujah. God is good. Nothing is too deep. And um, there is one more slide that I will show to you. And that will wrap all of these things up, and then y'all can leave. Um, no, not y'all, them. Because <laughs> someone's like, okay, we're just going to share the grace like that. 
I tell you what, Alan said something very remarkable. He says, nothing is too deep. Alrighty. So what do we see here? Um, a couple of weeks ago, this particular cloud appeared over Turkey. And when people saw this cloud, the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, go and get yourself amused in the comments. I said, okay, it's going to be fun. And when I got in the comments, I saw people saying, oh, this is some kind of lenticulous cloud. And I'm like, lenticulous clouds? We know what those are. If you are in a very highly mountainous region and there is a storm, lenticulous or whatever they call them, they're temporary clouds. They're like little cyclones of dust. And before you can bring out your camera, they're gone. We've been students of geography for decades. You cannot bamboozle us by telling us this is a lenticulous whatever. This is a sign. And we know what sign this is. This was the picture that went viral, but this was only one perspective. When you look at this thing from the side, it continues into the heavens. Even from this picture, you can see that it has a tail and it continues into the heavens. This was the sign that was prophesied by Joel in Joel chapter 2 verse 30. He says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. He says, I will show these signs in the heavens. And this thing, when you look at it from the side, it is a pillar of smoke. We saw that sign. It is a warning to the inhabitants of the earth. And the cloud was hovering about the same region where the book of Revelation was written. The book of Revelation was written on the island of Patmos, just a little to the east of where that thing appeared. And now we're still waiting for, and we're in the season of what? We're in the season of the revelation of the Antichrist. The Lord said to me before this earthquake, when did this earthquake happen? It happened on a Monday, Sunday into Monday. The Saturday night we were here. And the Lord said to me, he said, tell them, but don't focus on it. Because I want them to not get occupied with what is coming as much as who is coming. And remember on the day, what did I tell you? I said that I see the earthquakes and I see the Antichrist. And what did we see when the earthquake happened? The one that took 43,000 lives. We're told not to worry too much about that, but to worry about the one that are called the three sixes because there were three other earthquakes that did not cause as much disruption in the moment, but they were category six and they were called the three sixes. Do you also believe that exactly 36 days, which is another set of six, another three sets of six, exactly 36 days after this cloud of warning appeared in the sky, the, lay, the ground opened up and swallowed 43,000 people. Many more still missing, but that is the count as of today. And so what are we talking about? Are we still thinking that these things are coincidences? Whereas in the entire Bible and all the scripture sets that we have, God never for once used the word coincidence. You will not find the word coincidence in the Bible. In fact, in the Hebrew language, they do not have a word for coincidence. Because the Bible says that everything that happens only happens by the word of God. I come to you today in Jesus' name to not be among the ones who are still asleep. We are to awake from our sleep. Jesus says, do not give sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. He says, do not be drunk with the wine of their carousing, but be sober and be vigilant. The people who are drunk with the wine of their carousing go to watch the games only to be entertained, but we watch so that we will know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches because every actor on the field of play globally today is telling us something. So look at what we have. We saw the sign and, we, and the earthquakes came. So now what? Jesus specifically said something about the earthquakes. The prophet said very clearly about the earthquakes. I'm going to look into, we're going to look into two or three things about the earthquakes. Because immediately after the earthquakes, there are certain things that we need to do. We need to posture ourselves right. To the world, they don't know what is going on. On Tuesday, for those of you that were here, we, we looked into the alien army. Right? Remember that it was just on Tuesday that I was telling you about the army of Joel chapter 2 that is going to be a physical army. They're going to be taller than us, stronger than us. Our weapons are not going to be able to do anything to them, but they're coming to take out the wicked. It's a physical army. 
It's not a spiritual army. We're not talking about demons, but we're talking about an army that the Lord had reserved for himself. We will touch on that again today because I see a couple of faces who were not here and I don't want you to be ignorant of the mission of this army because at the same time, I told you about the lie that is about to be in the news. Wherein the ones delivering it will speak it as though it is the truth, but we will know where the lie exactly is. I will touch on that again today, but I want you to take a close look at what we're seeing and what scripture is saying so that we can brace up right. We do not have that much time. The Antichrist is about to be fully revealed. If we have three months, maybe. You see, but there is a significance. Some of the things that Alan was talking about, I'm not going to get into it too much because I've preached about them several times. The reason why you saw the four kings before you saw the rest of the seven mountains is because the four kings also represent the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they showed up before the other kings came. And when did they show up? They showed up just before the sixth bowl was unleashed. And what was the most striking evidence of the sixth bowl? The earthquakes. So now we know that the four horsemen of the apocalypse have come, they have done what they're supposed to do. Now it is time for you and I to know exactly what we are supposed to do and how to posture ourselves. We will continue in great detail in just a little while, but I want us to read one more scripture and pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because you are with us always. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me very quickly to the book of Revelations. We're going to read from verse 14. Verse 6 says, Then I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who do well on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel came in verse 8. And the angel says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this time that we have come to. We thank you, Lord, because our expectations are a holy expectation. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we do not have to expect the wrath that is coming because it is not coming upon us. It is coming around us so that we may know exactly where we're at and that your promise upon our lives may be fulfilled, which says that only with our eyes shall we behold the reward of the wicked. However, Lord, as your angels have been sent forth to administer your message to the world and also to the churches. Lord, may we deduce that which is ours quickly. Act on it in righteousness so that we are at peace in the day of trouble. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because none of these ones will run out of oil, but every single one of us will learn to remain in the seal of your Holy Spirit, even in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. About a year ago, I was taken in a vision and I saw camps that had been prepared for the body of Christ. And I shared with us that I see we are no longer just standing together for orientation, but each one of us is being asked to go to a special group for special assignments. How many people remember that? Wherein I shared with us, we were just before we left the basement, that we were about to be given several divisions, wherein we're going to be schooled and prepared for the assignment that we are meant to carry out just as we receive the Lord Jesus. And we left it at that, and we just continued. And today, I saw very clearly the same camp of meeting. Nothing's changed. The same camp. The only difference this time was that the angels were speaking amongst themselves and saying, we are ready for them. They are ready to receive us in two oppositions. And so I want to encourage you, this is a season of obedience. This is not the season to wrestle with the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, let me explain something that really throws people off, okay? And I want to explain it very carefully. Every single one of us here are spirit beings who are equipped by God to be able to interact with multiple dimensions. You know, I spent about three months in the year 2022. I think it even started in late 2021 into 2022, teaching us how to be multidimensional beings. I give examples of how I would prophesy over one person and while I'm speaking, expressly speaking and demonstrating with speed flying out of my face and yet I'm in another vision seeing about somebody else. Because our Heavenly Father is omnipresent. He is not just restricted to one place and if truly you and I are made in his image and in his likeness, guess what? We are supposed to be as multidimensional as he is. When Jesus was raised from the dead, there was an account that 500 people in different locations saw him at the same time. Jesus was able to walk through the door while the door was still shut. He just showed up simply because he knew how to jump dimensions. And so we are multidimensional beings and there are times wherein because of the privileges that we have had of being able to interact with the scriptures whilst also interacting with the Holy Spirit, we get to interact with our spouses, our friends, our own thoughts and angels. And so there are times wherein all of these things are going on at the same time, whether you're conscious of it or not, it doesn't matter, it happens. Do you know that there are times wherein you come back from work and you're seemingly happy, everything is nice and dandy, you sit down for 30 minutes and by the time you get up, you feel depressed. And you're like, what, what happened? I was happy just a moment ago. Yeah, because while you were sleeping, in your thoughts, the wicked ones have come and they have sown thoughts into your mind and you were not aware of it. And that is the reason why your mood just changes. Nobody wants to wake up. And just say, today I'm just going to be sad. Woo -hoo! If you're glad about being sad, then you're not sad. You understand what I mean? And so the reality of it is this. Because we are not as conscious of our privileges, does not mean that the privileges are not there. And with great privilege comes what? Great responsibility. And that is the reason why the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the forces that govern life. The animals do not have a heart like God. But we have a heart like God. That is the reason why our hearts are, are capable of creating and producing just like God. The Bible says, out of our heart are the forces that govern life. And so if God has truly made you in his image and in your likeness and in his likeness, in his image and likeness, then you need to be conscious of your privileges. Conita, if I give you 20 bars of gold to keep overnight, you will lock your door like you've never locked it. After you've used all the locks, what are you going to do? You'll go, you will grab a dining chair and then you're going to prop it against the door. You're going to move the couch and put it in there. And then you speak in tongues for two hours until you fall asleep. Because you do not want anything to come and take the 20 bars away because it will be required of you. And that is how we are as believers. We have been given so much privilege and we were also told that the enemy, Jesus says your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom that he might devour. He is the thief that comes not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So if you know that there is someone out there who is looking to dispossess you of the true assets of the kingdom that you possess, would you be lackadaisical about what you have been given? It is a privilege, but there is no privilege that comes without responsibility. That is a message to every man in the house. It is a privilege to have help. It is a privilege to have a wife. But guess what? With that privilege comes much responsibility. You need to learn how to hear things that she hasn't even said. You understand what I mean? There are some of my friends, some of my guy friends that I haven't talked to in like seven years. Whether they are here or they have gone to heaven, I don't know. And sometimes, I don't care. But then if I'm at home and I don't see my wife for seven minutes, I'm like, hey, you good? You are okay? Because my life depends on the help that I have. Everybody needs help because at some point, everybody goes under. 
That is the reason why Lazarus, his name was called Lazarus because Lazarus means the one who has help. And if you have help, you don't have to be afraid of going under because when you have help, that help is the Holy Spirit. It will bring you back up again. One of the greatest responsibilities that we have is here in the book of Exodus chapter 23. I believe it's Exodus 23, 21. I've, I've always quoted it to you, but I want us to read it today so that you will know. Verse 20 of Exodus 23. So if you want to remember it, it is 20, 23 backwards. This is 23, 20. And what does it say? Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Every time God is on the move, every time there is an exodus, every time God is pulling down Egypt so that he can pull out his children, there is always an angel of the Lord that goes to make an announcement. There is always an angel of the Lord that is sent. We read in Revelation chapter 14 verse, verse, uh, chapter 14 verse 6 that we just read now. What does it say? It says Babylon is falling. Now where have we been held captive? Isaiah said, be mindful of your captivity while you remain in her, the great city. We are held captive in Babylon. That is the reason why Jesus says, look up for your redemption is near. If you're already free, do you need redemption? Paul said, if we have received everything that was promised as part of this salvation, he says, then why do we need to hope? He said, but we hope because we have yet to receive. Ephesians chapter 4. I don't know about you, but there are days wherein I see my little four-year-old son jump from one couch to the other, and I want to do the same. I will make it to the other couch, but then I would have to lay there for five minutes. And in some cases, for 50 before I can recover. I don't know about you, but when there is pollen season, I keep my windows closed because I am anointed all right, but somehow that pollen manages to sneak behind the anointing sometimes. And your eyes become watery and you begin to sneeze. And why is all of that happening? Because even though my human, my spirit is born again, regenerated in Christ Jesus, my body is still here in this state, depleting away. The Bible says the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. The redemption is the complete package wherein not just your spirit is set free, but your mind is immune to the corruption of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and your body loses the animality that it has. The bestiality of your flesh goes away at redemption because the Bible says we're going to put away corruption and put on that immortal body. And so we know that there is still work to do. So in the meantime, where is this body held? I keep telling you, we are not yet free in this world. The Bible says whom the son says free is free indeed. But at the same time, the Bible also says that you are seated in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the father. And you are sitting here. You understand what I mean? So which part of you is seated in Christ Jesus? Your spirit. Your spirit is set free. Your spirit is seated in Christ Jesus. But that is not all of what Jesus paid for. Jesus paid for you to become a new creation, spirit, soul, and body. And so we know that as long as we are in this world, there are certain things that we are subject to. And that is the reason why I personally cannot wait for Babylon to fall. Babylon is not the United States of America. Sorry to bust your bubble. Because you know, when I was coming here in 2010, my brother said to me, are you sure you want to take a job in America? I said, absolutely. I thought he was going to remind me that the pound was $2 to a pound. I thought he wanted to talk about how much money or how much power the British pound had over the dollar. But he said to me, he said, but do you not know that America is Babylon? And I looked at him, I said, yes, but I am Daniel. Even if America is Babylon, I'll be just fine. That was what I told him. I spoke by the Holy Spirit. Even I did not know the fullness of what I said until about three years later when the Lord revealed to me that he brought me here as a Daniel. But it's not America. It is this civilization that is Babylon. Because if you think it is America and you check out and you go to Switzerland, you're going from frying pan to fire. Because Satan literally lives in Switzerland. 
Yeah. It's in, it's in, no, uh, it's in your Bible. It's in your Bible. The Bible says when, when, the, when the Lord Jesus appeared to John and was telling him, he says where Satan has his abode, the place where Antipas was killed. Antipas was killed in modern day Geneva. And where is Geneva? In Switzerland. And so, if you think you have one place that you want to go to, do you know that the ancient temple of Apollyon was, is just right outside of Geneva? Also, where? In the same Switzerland. And that is the place where they have CERN now. Because another name for the God of destruction is what? Cernunus. That's why they shortened the name to CERN. I used to work as a CERN contractor. I know what I am saying. And I know the things that my eyes saw while I was there. And so I know that some of these things are not just, um, you know, we're not making things up. We're not trying to be conspiracy theorists here. Because let me tell you something. If I had an option to choose a career, I would choose to be a conspiracy theorist. Look at how well we are selling today. All of that stuff that we said in 2020 that people told us that we were full of ourselves, we were like, well, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, but you are about to find out. Because the Bible says that the things of God are foolishness unto them that are without. They do not know until it is too late. Amen. We said every one of those things back then. I, was, I sent a video to my son because my son, sometimes he says to me, Dad, you are such a conspiracy theorist. And I said to him, I said, well, do you know the reality of it is that I'm not from here. And I'm not just talking about this country. I am not from this time. And you know. So when I'm telling him stuff, I'm like, I'm not from this time. The time that I am from, these things are plain. But to you, in this time, they're still hidden. And so two days ago, we, we saw a video of a gentleman scientist that was giving the deposition to the Senate. And he was very plain in his deposition and nobody could challenge him because he came with loads and loads of files containing facts and signatures of people regarding a lot of the stuff that I have been called a conspiracy theorist about. I tell my son every time he talks about private jets, my son is fascinated with planes. There is no plane in production today that he cannot identify by just seeing the control panel. You can blindfold him, put it in the plane, it will tell you what it is. It will tell you what year was manufactured, how many of them, and all the licenses that it has, the patents. It can recite you what those patents are in some cases. He's fascinated by those things, but I have no interest. And I always tell him, I said, do you know that I'm happy that you know these things, but it breaks my heart for the rest of humanity that we're still flying planes? that have jet engines? Do you know that, do you know how backward that is? Do you know how backward it is that we're still putting gas into our vehicles and generating power as we go along? The most efficient ice engines, internal combustion engines that we have are at best 44% efficient in theory. In practice, they're about 32 to 37%. You can go and look up the facts. So a lot of the gas that you're putting into your car is literally burning away as fumes, as heat, and as all kinds of pollutants. Now, this is not about green revolution. I may be wearing a green suit, but all of that is yet another religion. You understand what I mean? Okay? Yeah, because the Bible warns us about this green revolution. The Bible says in the last days, men will choose to worship the creation instead of the creator. And that is the reason why there is no new age religion without a green agenda. Because it's all about magnifying nature over the creator of it. But what I am telling you is that all of these things are backward. I have been saying this thing for no less than seven years, almost every chance that I get. I have been uninvited to conferences because they knew that I would come and I would slot it in. And I've been saying technology is been hidden from us. This is nonsense. This doesn't make any sense. And this gentleman who stood before Congress a couple of days ago, he said since 1954, we have been able to manipulate density, even though he used the word gravity. They're only just coming up. We know the real thing is density. He said we have been able, and, and you know what? It was interesting. He didn't use the word gravity. He used the word G. And that's because even they know that people are waking up to the point right now where they know there is no such thing as gravity. Everything rises and falls by density. If you're wondering, if I know what I'm saying, light a candle and watch where it burns. When you light a candle, it burns upwards. If there was gravity, it should burn sideways. 
But the reason why it burns upward is because it's less dense than the air that is immediately around it. So if everything rises and falls by density, why do we need gravity? I'm a physicist of six years, six straight years of studying physics, and there is no equation that we work gravity into that we don't cancel it out later. So at the end of the day, here is the deal. The guy says we now have control over the G such that we do not need jet engines or anything that has combustion. We can use magnetism and electromagnetism to lift objects as heavy as skyscrapers. And, we just, and they just levitate and they just move around. Now, he was saying this to Congress and nobody could question him because he mentioned the names of the agencies and has a record of the signatures of the people that signed off on it. He said, but these things were locked down and they were blacked out. And you know the one that, that really amused me the most? I told my son, I said, do you know that as far as the beginning of the 20th century, I think 19, maybe 12 or 22, one of those years, a car was demonstrated that runs on atmospheric energy. In the atmosphere that you have, there is enough electricity that we should never, in fact, our generation should never have heard the word battery, ever. No, you know, it, battery is a slap in our faces. Literally, is a battery. That we are using batteries. Because there is enough energy in the atmosphere. And you know what the guy said? He said, so the question that I want this Senate to answer is why did we lock up the project and get people using diesel and gasoline and engines that break down? Whereas in fact, what we think is advanced today, which is electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are just another plot for them to continue to control energy and control our lives. The reality of it is we don't even need it. We can drive around cars that charge themselves in the air as they go. Everything around us runs on electricity. Trees run on electricity. Have you ever seen them stopping somewhere to charge? <laughs> Every now and again they tell us that lightning is dangerous because one lightning strike releases enough energy to power all of the United States of America. Sometimes more than a year, just one lightning strike. And you think all of that just dissipates. It doesn't go anywhere. He's waiting for us to tap into it. And they called us conspiracy theorists. But now the truth is out. It's coming out. But that is not even the real truth. The real truth that I'm most excited about is the one that Jesus himself will come to announce. And that is that the earth belongs to us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The earth belongs to us. For centuries, they kept telling us, for centuries, that we just need to be good, die, and go to heaven. And every time you look into your Bible, you're looking for that scripture, you never find it. How many, how many times have you looked to see where it is in the Bible that says that one day we're just all going to die and go to heaven? The contrary is what you see. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In Psalms 82, God says, I am coming to remove the ones that I put in place because they have not done right by me. They were supposed to look after the weak and the fatherless, but they have taken advantage of them. He says, behold, I come and I will possess the earth again. And then what does he do with the earth when he possesses it? He gives it to the sons of men and he comes to dwell with them. He says, where I am, there, there you will be also. And where does he want to be? He wants to be with the sons of men forever and ever. And before we inherit that new Jerusalem that is not built by hands, we will first of all have a demonstration of a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. A, a demonstration of a thousand years of reigning with Christ upon this earth. Isn't that great news to know that one day you can go and build wherever you want without getting permit from somebody who limits how much you can build or how well you want to build? You may not have had that problem, but I have. I have designed stuff that I want to build in my backyard and someone says, no, you can't. And one day I'm looking forward to that day wherein I can go to an island of my own and just do whatever I want. And you know what? God does not have to worry about it because the Bible says when we come back with that new body, the spirit of the wisdom of God is going to be in each and every one of us so that we will know what to do. The law is not made for the righteous. If every one of us is made perfect in Christ, then we don't need laws to police us. 
The reason why we're being policed by laws and regulations today is because we don't know who we are and the ones who are policing us know that we don't. Anyway, I'm going to tell you one more thing and then we're going to pray. Today I want us to pray. You see all of what Alan's shown to you, if you haven't started operating at that level of paying attention to everything that you see, the clouds and all of that good stuff, please begin to do yourself a favor by paying attention. If you pay attention, you will receive instruction. That is what the word of God says. The word of God says, my son, incline your ears to my sayings and you will receive instructions. And so if the only reason why we don't receive is because we don't perceive. And for us to perceive, we need to be ready to sieve. What does it mean to sieve? You need to be ready to test all things that you may know that which is of God. Don't just receive everything they're saying because they're saying it. Who are they? Who has the light? Who did Jesus die for? You or the principalities that are currently ruling the world. They know that their fate is already sealed. Right, the book of Revelation talks about the fact that all those principalities that have been ruling, Satan and his fallen angels, they have their places prepared in the lake of fire where they will burn forever and ever. So they, they're just doing what they, what they have to do. But you don't have to perish with them. You can still choose to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying and be in the position of one that will rise when everything else falls. I will read to you a verse of scripture from the book of Daniel. And then I'm going to put all of these things together by the grace of God in five minutes and then we're going to close it out with some confessions. Daniel chapter 12. How many people enjoyed the Joel chapter 2 that we read? Yeah, I enjoyed it too until I got home. And as soon as I got home, I sat down and the Lord said to me, he says, go to TikTok, I have something for you. And so I went to TikTok and literally there was a video as soon as I opened it and the video was of a masked man. His face was covered. He was breathing heavily. He was doing the video from inside of a cave and he was warning people. He said, the Anunnaki are here. Anybody ever heard the word Anunnaki? Oh, you see, those people are the conspiracy theorists. We need to make t-shirts for them so that we can know who they are. Yeah, the word Anunnaki comes from the Sumerian texts. The Sumerian texts, uh, when you look at you know, various texts that make up what we call scripture today, even though the Sumerian texts have not been very well embraced as, opposed to, as being part of scripture, but they contain very detailed history of several civilizations and generations of wickedness before the time of Abraham. And they even have details of the flood and all of that good stuff. And, you know, some of the newly discovered um, texts from the, um, from the Sumerian cuneiforms or cuneiforms, uh, can't say that word, right? Sometimes they actually contain details of what happened, the expression on Pharaoh's face when he saw that Moses was gone forever. As they got into that and the water was covering them and Moses was standing among the bulrushes. Remember that when Moses was taken up by the daughter of Pharaoh, he was in the bulrushes. He was among the reed. You know that he was found in among the reed. And so that which is called the Red Sea is literally spelled the Reed Sea, but the translators did not understand the repetition of that sound, and so they just called it the Red Sea. But it was the Reed Sea, because there's nothing red about the Red Sea, come to think about it. So it was the same way that God took him into the palace of Pharaoh, that God brought him out. He came out into the reeds as he was stepping out of the water. Let me tell you something, because the water was already closing, before the last step was taken so that his name can truly be fulfilled that was called drawn out of water. So he didn't just pass through dry land, he was brought out of water. And we found these details in the cuneiforms of the Sumerians. Now the Sumerians believe that there are some people called the Anunnaki. They're the same people that Enoch calls the watchers. The Anunnaki are meant to be called, I mean the Anunnaki are called, uh, what's the meaning of Anunnaki? The ones from the stars. Anu, yeah, Anunnaki, they are the ones from the stars. The watchers came from above to be positioned upon the earth, but they committed adultery with the daughters of men because they couldn't resist the beauty of women and decided to take wives. Jude chapter, 14, Jude chapter 1 verse 14 tell, I mean, tells us a little bit more about that where Jude was quoting Enoch. But the thing about the Anunnaki is this, Genesis chapter 6 calls them the sons of God. 
The word sons of God means the sons of the heavens, the sons of the elves. They come from above. They were not born here. They look like us. They have bodies. They can walk around. They can eat. But they are not from here. You see what I mean? That's essentially what the, the term um, sons of God and sons of men. And that is the reason why Adam himself in the genealogy of Jesus is classified as a son of God because even though he was from, formed of the dust of the earth, he was not born of a man. And so if you're not born of a man and you're made by another kind of creation, you are called directly a son of God because no man can lay credit to your birth. Does it make sense? Alrighty. And that is the reason why when Jesus was to be born, about 3,000 years before Jesus was born, when God was telling Adam, what did God tell Adam? God said to Adam that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. And do you know that women don't have seed necessarily? It is men who have what? Who have seed. And so that woman got that seed not by be, being, be, being engaged to somebody, but she received that seed as a gift from God. And that is the reason why the Bible says in Psalm 68 that the Lord, he's given, the Lord will receive gifts out of the rebellious. And so for God to receive something, that means he has to give it because everything comes from him. The Bible says there is nothing any man has that he has not received from above. Now this is very critical and I want us to listen to this. I mentioned this and when I was talking to my brother about something else, my brother was coming from some kind of dimension. He was being very deep, even though we're told now that nothing is too deep. So I told him, I said, what you're saying? I mentioned it while I was preaching. He said, how did you say it? So I told him how I said it. And he was like, that's it? I said, well, uh, that's it. I said, but I guess I needed to explain a little further. When I told you that Jesus had to come through Mary because God wants to receive us. And what do I mean by that? Let me quickly explain. Mary means the rebellious, right? Martha means rebellion. Remember that? That's the reason why I told you that Lot's life was very difficult. He had to die because he was surrounded by those two, the rebellion and rebellious, right? Lazarus. I keep using the word Lot. That was what I did the last time. Yeah. Yeah. What is the meaning of Lot again? Anybody? Somebody? Nobody. Let's go back to Lazarus. <laughs> so here is the deal. So God will not ask you to give to him what he hasn't first of all given to you because the question is, where would you get it from? Because there is, the Bible says there is nothing any man has that he has not received from above, right? So if God is asking you to give him your life as a missionary to the nations, that is because he has already given to you the calling and the divine enablement to be able to be a missionary unto the nations. He told Abraham, I want you to be the father of many nations. And Abraham was like, oh, I don't know how that is going to happen because I don't even have much energy left in me. And my wife is past menopause like 50 years ago. And how is this going to happen? And God was like, okay, I will give you what it takes. And then he gave him the name Abraham which means the father of many nations. And when God gave that to him, God was able to receive from him. And so because God wants to receive you and I in the end when rebellion against God is at an all-time high. You know, Jesus was given an insight by the father into the last days. And what Jesus saw, Jesus wasn't happy about it. Jesus says, when I return, is this what I'm coming into? He says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? And what did he do? He was like, I hope so. When Jesus says, I hope so, you better pray. You understand what I mean? But that was what the father revealed to him. He saw how bad things would be. And he was like in the midst of all this. Is that going to be anybody? And Jesus told his disciples, he says, I have seen the end. And even the elect are falling. Is there Matthew chapter 24. He said the deception and the wine of deception was so intense that even the elect are falling. Who is going to stand? And God says, I am going to receive a gift of an elect even from the midst of that rebellion. And that is the reason why God, first of all, had to give us a gift out of the rebellious. Does it make sense? Alrighty. And so why I am citing that again is this. We have come to such a time that God is more eager than you and I for the end to come. Because he was the one who planted the vineyard. And the corn cannot be more eager to be harvested than the farmer. The farmer wants result. And that is the reason why God told us the other day that we have been immune against loss. God ensured us by his grace so that no matter what happens in the world, he can never lose because even if there is more immorality and sin in the world, God already took an insurance policy that pays him double for every sin. 
It is there in the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, it says that you, that the Lord will receive double for every sin. And that is the reason why the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And so what that means that if when all of these things are going on, you and I need to know so that our hearts do not fail us for fear. Why? Because when we are not conscious of what we're thinking and thoughts that are being suggested in our hearts and the subliminal messages that the enemy is showing us through advertisements, through political speeches and all that good stuff, we begin to feel sad without even knowing why. So what do you need to do? You need to know exactly what is going on so that you can be on guard and not let the devil take your joy. They need all that resource in order to be able to fight Jesus when he comes. All right? So let's go back to what happened. When the Lord said to me, go to TikTok, I have something for you. I went on TikTok and I saw this video. And this guy was like, the Anunnaki is here. He says, and they have started killing Russian soldiers. This man is a grown man, even though I couldn't see his face, you could tell from his voice, he's a grown man, and he was sounding as though he had just seen the devil himself. He was so terrified. He was afraid of what he was reading. And when he looked into that report, and when he was giving that report of what he had seen, this is exactly what he said. He said that they saw Russian soldiers they heard because there was only one person who survived. When he said that, I was like, okay, even if I didn't want to believe this, now I believe this because this is consistent with scripture. In scripture, whenever God releases his warring soldiers to go and destroy, only one always survives. There's never been an instance where God sent his angels and two survived. When he sent his angels to Sodom and Gomorrah, only Lot, only one survived. Lot and his children, because those children, according to the word of God, they were part of the fulfillment of promise to Lot because they came out of his loins. And when you look at the temptation of Job, every attack that happened, where did he come from? He came from the hand of the, of the angels, of the ones that the Lord sent. Every time, what do you read in scripture? About seven different times or so, they will report back to Job and say, well, only I have survived to tell you. Only I survived to tell you. And when the Anunnaki were done dealing with the Russian soldiers, they left only one person. They watched him as a runaway to go and report. And the guy said, the men that attacked us, he says the exoskeleton was like copper, was like the color of burnished bronze. He said that was the exoskeleton. He says we were firing at them and it did nothing to them. By that time, I was beginning to shake where I was. I shook to the point where in my, the stool that I was sitting on started to shake as well because we had just read that in the book of Joel chapter 2 that when the Lord sends his army, a people that have never been seen before on the earth, what is going to happen? He said that the weapons of men will do nothing to them. He said they will come in between their artillery and nothing will hurt them. We read that just before I, got, I went home. It's right there in the book of Joel. And this guy was saying, they kept firing at them. He said, but them, whenever they fired, he said, anything that their weapon touches melts. And I'm like, where have we heard that before? When the Lord came down upon the Mount of Sinai, the moment the angels, the host of heaven touched the ground, the Bible says the mountains began to melt. These guys have so much power that they don't have to shoot you and then you'll be like, oh, you shot me. No, you just melt. And we know what their assignment is. Jesus called the same army the reapers in Matthew chapter 13. He says, my father will send the reapers and they will take out the wicked. But the wicked themselves are not going to go down without a shout. What I am telling you in a nutshell, folks, is that our reality has now become what we used to describe as fiction. Because the realm of the spirit and the natural world have now overlapped. All of 2020, we were looking at the stars. What was the most prominent sign that we saw in 2020? An overlap, an overlap. We saw all the, all the constellations were aligning. We saw that the sun and the moon started aligning. The reason why we have the blood moon is the blood moon is the most striking evidence that the realms are collapsing and the dimensions are overlapping. Because the reason why the blood, the moon turns into blood, Jesus said it. He says the sun will go black and it will cover the moon and the moon will turn into red. Which is what happens when you take a flashlight and you cover it with your palm. What happens? Your hand becomes red. Simply because white light is being covered by something that is what? That is opaque. 
And that is what the blood moon is. Satan never wanted us to know the signs when they come. And that is the reason why they've been telling you and I that the sun is 90 something million miles away and the moon is this and that. Do you know that they've been backtracking on all of those in the last couple of months? They've been slowly backtracking on, and they're like, oh, the moon is closer than we thought. Oh, the sun is closer than we thought. I'm like, don't worry, keep coming. We're right here. We'll be here the day you come to tell us in the news that actually they're, they're the same size. Because we've been saying that for years. That they look the same. And they're like, no, it's just an illusion. No, it's not an illusion. The Bible says that they are the same. One is just a greater light than the other. They tell us that the moon is a rock. But the Bible says that the moon is a lesser light. The moon is light. You cannot have a rock reflecting yellow light. And on some days it's white, some days it's amber, and some days it's red. Make up your mind. Is physics real or not? In 1 Timothy, the Bible tells us that in the last days, that which is not knowledge, they will even call science. Paul told Timothy. And what do we know? Everything that Paul told Timothy was written for the church. So here we are. Now they're, and I tell you, it's a shame if you wait for them to come and reveal it in the news before you believe it. Because by that time, you're not believing the word of God, you're believing the word of a man. And Romans chapter 3, verse 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. So I'm encouraging you, wake up from your inside and begin to see God's world the way He sees it. Because darkness is coming upon the earth and gross darkness to people. If you want to see through a political lens, you will miss Him. If you want to see through the eyes of the media, it is full of enchantment. You can only see through the eyes of the Word of God by believing what you read in His Word to be true. Now, let me tell you some things that I have seen recently. And the Lord said to me, I am showing you so that you can alert others. They've been trying to penetrate this, the firmament for the longest. They've been trying to break the sky open. They even, call, they even have a name for it, Operation Fishbowl. Several missiles have been fired at the firmament. But they're not going anywhere. Because the Bible says that God alone reserves the power to roll back the firmament of the heavens and he will roll it back when the time comes. And when he rolls back the firmament of the heavens, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the mountains will no longer be in their place. They're about, we are about to lose a giant portion of certain continents. Can I show you in scriptures real quick? Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because I have known these things for a very long time, but I didn't want to scare nobody. So I prayed to God one day. I said, God, you put me here from wherever you brought me from. Sometimes my timing is a little off. I said, but you see this woman that you have given to me? Her timing is right. About four years ago, this was what I told God. I said, God, everything that I'm seeing, I have been in. Because you take me to these places, whether I'm in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. I said, so sometimes I come back and I'm like, I'm about to tell them something like it's going to happen tomorrow, but it might not happen tomorrow. And then people are like, Ugh, he always says that. He's just, uh, he likes to scare people. <laughs> if I was selling books, then you'll understand the reason why. Because when people are afraid, they spend money. You understand what I mean? If I tell you something and I'm like, I have a book here that tells you more about the, you know, the red moons or the blood moons, then I would have an agenda. But I have no agenda. I'm not selling books. I'm not selling tapes. All the messages that we preach here are available for free. And so I don't want to just sound like I'm scaring people for nothing. So I prayed to God and I said, God, when the time comes for the skies to recede, show this woman. And a couple of days ago, maybe about a week and a half, my wife woke up from a dream. She said, I saw us in a place and the sky was really blue. He said, suddenly, water came like from nowhere and it flooded out the place where we were at. Initially, she didn't want to tell me. I woke up because the Holy Spirit told me, go and inquire about the dream. I did that to Alan like three times this week. He didn't even know that I was hounding him. I would call him and say, look, what have you seen? Simply because we are watchmen and we maintain different positions. So I don't just run with the things that I see, even though I see quite a bit. I ping other people, hey, what are you seeing? And I don't just go to people at random because I know some people will just make stuff up so that they don't look like they're less a prophet than I am. That has happened to me before. It took me a while to learn my lesson. There are some people that I will call them and they'll be like, oh, don't share the Lord. And they will make up this thing and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will say to me, did I ask you to come here? 
I'll be like, but I just saw his video online. He has 10,000 likes. And God was like, he told me clearly. He says, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are there. He said, but narrow is the path that leads to life and only a few are there. So one of the things that I have learned, which I have also taught you, is that the moment you see something mainstream, popular, everybody likes it, everybody raving about it, people bought in tickets to go to the place, run in the opposite direction because God is not in the midst of the crowd. I am saying that and I will say it again. Because I know some of y'all and some of the people, not the, the people here are spiritual people. Some of the people that will watch this video on YouTube, I am telling you, stay where you are. Jesus says, a time is coming, he said to the Samaritan woman. He said, a time is coming wherein you will no longer have to go to some place or come to this well. He said, because the Father is now seeking true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, a time is coming that they will say to you, we have found the Lord. There is a staring of the water. Let's go to the desert. Let's go to the wilderness. He said to them, do not follow them. He said, but you stay vigilant. Don't join the crowd. God has never been in the crowd. Find me one time wherein the move of God was being instructed and guided by a crowd of people. Even if the crowd will benefit, God chooses the few. That's all we need to know. Please save yourself the trouble of going across town because every revival that we need is already told us in the book of Acts. And the revival that we need is when once again, wherever two or three of us are gathered, the power of the Holy Spirit is strong enough to shake the room. There was no time in Acts of the Apostles that they had to go to the next town to engage the power of the Holy Spirit. There are so many things that have been stirred up in the world today by the beast that is coming from the abyss. It is called, what do we call it? In security, we used to call it the honey net, a honey pot. Things have been set up to draw the unsuspecting civilians in and then they will be trapped in that experience. I tell you, every revival that has been a revival of the mountain or a revival of the well has resulted into whitewashed sepulchers, people who built tabernacles around experiences and never have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Please choose a revival that you can take with you from your bathroom to your kitchen and to your friend's house and eventually to the house of God. Choose that revival that is portable because anyone that you have to run to, a day is coming wherein you will not be able to cross borders. Jesus said it. He said the time is coming wherein you will never be able to go hither nor thither. He says that time is when you need to go to the mountains and lock in place. The real lockdown is coming but you must know and you must know where to go. So I want to encourage you folks the Lord is doing something great amongst us, but the Lord is not in the crowd. And so I learned to stop following all those people because they have led me astray. So what do I do? I call the ones that have borne fruits by integrity of hearing from God consistently. So I told God, tell this woman. And so my wife didn't want to tell me. I came, I came, I, I came to her. I said, tell me your dream. And she was like, I don't know. I'm not even sure if I want to tell you it's a bad dream. I said, but tell me. And when she told me the dream, I started to dance. And she was like, really? I said, and this was where she repeated herself. She said, I said that the house wherein we were was flooded with water. We couldn't even find you. You understand what I mean? You know, naturally, I was supposed to be concerned. You know me, every time somebody tells me a dream, my first question is, was I in it? Yeah. I've told you that before. I am vain like that. You see, if my wife tells me a dream, was I in it? What was I wearing? What did I say? But this time around, she said, we couldn't even find you in the dream. We found somebody that we love very dearly and he had collapsed and become unconscious under the influence of the water and we were praying for him when I woke up and I, stepped, I kept dancing. And she was like, what is this about? And I said, I have been waiting for this dream for so long because finally the Lord has shown to me the receding of the clouds, of the skies. When the skies recede, water will come and people will not be able to explain where it's coming from because the Bible says in the day that the Lord God created the firmament, he said, let the firmament 
be in the midst of the waters, separating the waters from the waters. The waters above, he calls heaven. And that is the reason why when you look up, it is blue because it is water. And so when that sky recedes, it's not all of it that will recede because we cannot even accommodate that. When it recedes, what's going to happen? Water will come and it will take mountains out of their places. Land will disappear. And what's going to follow? The stars of the heavens will start falling to the ground. Do you know that the stars of the heavens have started falling to the ground already? If you have any social media account, I'm sure you've seen them. And what do they call them? They're like, oh, there's a meteor shower. Yeah. There is a meteor. What is the word meteor? The word meteor means star. Asteroids are stars. And so when you say that they're falling, that is scripture. But the fact that you make up some Latin word doesn't mean we don't know what the word of God has said. So the stars of the heavens are falling to the ground. All the signs are around us. There is no reason why any one of us should miss our visitation. I am begging you. I am pleading with you. Open your eyes and see what the Lord is saying unto his churches. You know one of the things that Jesus kept telling John when they were showing him the revelation was this. He kept repeating it. And when I say Jesus, I know some of you are like, no, it wasn't Jesus, it was an angel. That's because you didn't read chapter 1. Chapter 1 of the book of Revelations, the Bible says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that his father gave to him that he may show unto the sons of men and it was given through the hand of his angel. So you see that angel that kept following John? That angel was following John in the capacity of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And because he was given the name of Jesus to deliver the message, there were times, in fact, there was one particular time that John thought it was Jesus and he fell to the ground to worship him. And the angel was like, hey, slow down. I'm a man just like you. What does that mean? When I am moving in the name of Jesus, fulfilling a divine assignment, Satan cannot tell if it's Jesus or if it's just Moses. Anyway, that's... That's just a nugget. If you know how to use it, please use it away. But here is what I am saying. The angel of the Lord has gone before us. The angel of the Lord is making an announcement. The angels are throwing the stars from the heavens. The angels are forming the clouds of blood and pillars of smoke. The angels are creating the signs of the cloud. You saw the one that formed over France the other day. That is the reason why I said pray for France because they have also received their cloud of warning and now we're just counting the days. Pray for the people in Western Europe in general. They have one of the people that have seen the most. They've had the most sightings in the last seven days of the stars of the heavens fall into the ground. When we see these things, what do we do? We know that our redemption is near and we're not supposed to keep quiet. We're supposed to watch and pray. Have you wondered why in the last six months to a year it's become easier than ever before to pray? It's not because God is just like throwing out the, the spirit of prayer. It's because we need to pray. And if you're not there yet, it's not too late, at least as of this Saturday, to join in. And be praying every chance that you get, pray. Because Jesus says, watch and pray. He didn't just say lift up your eyes and be like, oh my God, the stars. No, he says pray. Why do we pray? We pray so that we, uh, in fact, I'm going to tell you two reasons why you must pray. I thought the time was even more gone than now, but it isn't. It's not even close to nine yet. So let me tell you two things, two reasons why you must pray. I will tell you one, I will finish my story about the guy who saw the Anunnaki and I'm going to tell you the other one. Reason number one why you must pray is because of you, yourself. Jesus, after, you know when Jesus started to prophesy about the end times, where? Luke 17, right? Luke 17 was when he started to let his disciples know the things that he was seeing. But we knew he had been seeing those things from like Luke chapter four because the moment he started seeing the last days, what did he do? He started spending more time on the mountains. It's in the Gospels. He started to withdraw himself more and more because he knew that he had to pray for the ones who will come in the last days. That was why all of John 17, he was just praying. He was praying that the Lord will keep us even after all this calamity comes. He told his disciples, after the very first round of prophecies, he said to them in Luke 18, he says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. If God says that you must pray so that you don't faint, then that means if you do not pray, you will be faint. And when Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane, the one who was carrying the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future, because you know in Psalms 32, the Bible says that all of our sins, the one in the past has already been blotted out, the one in the present is covered, and the one in the future, the Lord is not gonna impute it against us. And that was the weight that Jesus was carrying and he could still pray. But the disciples who were not carrying anything but a few loaves of bread and fish, they were too tired to pray. 
They were falling asleep. And Jesus said to them, I already told you to pray. So don't wait until, okay, the Lord's given me the permission to say this. Don't wait until they show you in the news food being tossed out of airplanes for the sustenance of some before you pray. Because by that time, it's too late. Alrighty. Because of the fact that the Bible says that all of what they're plotting is vain. Why do the kings of the earth plot a vain thing? Acts chapter 4. When Peter was saying that, what was he doing? He was quoting Psalms chapter 2. That the kings of the earth will plot a vain thing. So their plans will go wrong and they will try to make up for it because they need a little bit more time. So they will start tossing food out to people. When that time comes, it's too late. That is your sign. But you don't want to wait until that time because you don't know when it's going to be. So what do you do? You start praying now. And what did we say last year? Learn to pray at least an hour. That was what Jesus required of his disciples. He says, watch with me an hour. So why do you pray? You pray so that you yourself are not faint hearted. That's thing number one. Let's finish the Anunnaki story. So when the guy said the Anunnaki are here and they're beginning to kill soldiers, he said one thing in particular. What he said, he said they must have been there without the soldiers knowing. He said because they only came up out of the cave when an explosion went out inside of the cave. So don't think that the Anunnaki are here just for Russian soldiers. Those soldiers just happen to have stared the pot before this army is ready to be released. All right, you see what I'm saying? Don't worry, I look like I have four heads right now because the things that I'm saying are strange. But I warned you ahead of time. Yes, on, on Saturday, was it Saturday or Tuesday? The last meeting, whatever it was that we had here. What did I tell you? I said that I saw two vortexes and they represent the seraphim. And I didn't explain myself, but now I'm just going to tell you a lot of strange things are going to be coming out from this place. Simply because the seraphim are some of the strangest looking people and their revelations are equally strange. Till today, not anybody that I know understands the prophecies of Ezekiel when he saw the wheel in the wheel because that was the work of the seraphim. So I want to encourage you, pay attention to these things because I look like I have four heads because they have four heads, but the reality of what I am telling you is that we need to be multi-dimensional listeners. You need to be able to hear and listen at the same time. The second reason why you must pray is because Babylon is falling and you need to carve for yourself a new place to stay. I told you on Tuesday when I was here, was it Tuesday or Saturday last week when I saw the seven mountains? It was Saturday. Do you remember that, Nicole? Because you were here on Saturday. You remember that when I stood in the middle of my teaching and I said about three different times that I saw seven mountains and the mountains have been uprooted, right? So that was Saturday. I didn't watch the game. I didn't know about the seven mountains that were demonstrated during Super Bowl until Alan brought it to my attention, but I had already seen the mountains being uprooted because God is taking out Babylon. And when God, praise God, and when God is taking out Babylon, what do you do? You pray. You understand what I mean? Why do you pray? Because prayer is the only requirement given to man for inheritance. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is the definition of the meek? The ones who humble themselves before the Lord. And what is another word for humbling yourself before the Lord? Supplication. It is only the people who pray that will hold the title deed to the land that they are going to possess. Are those good reasons for us to pray? They are good reasons for us to pray. Maybe I'll give you a third one, and this is how we're going to wrap up. In fact, Alan, let's break bread with this verse of Scripture. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And did I slow down a little bit today? Because I heard you said the last time I was not using punctuations, I just kept going. So I made an effort today to slow down, even though there was still a lot that I want to share with you. Oh, punctuations are not in the Bible, in the New Testament especially, because they were written in Greeks, and the Greeks, the Greeks don't punctuate anything. They just keep writing. I went to school with a bunch of Greeks, and when they send you a text message, 
You have to read it and pray before you even know what they're saying. Because they would type in English. If I, one of my flatmates, when I was doing my master's, he used to call text messages, text massages. I'm like, man, I wish they could just massage me. <laughs> but no punctuation. Alrighty, there you go. So what did we say we were going to read just now? Daniel chapter 12. Ezekiel, Daniel. Amen, 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 amen. So I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, why am I doing this of late? Wherein, if I'm looking for a scripture, I have to remember the song that I learned when I was a kid to find scriptures. I can always just go to a scripture. Sometimes I can close my eyes and open to a particular book. And he said to me, he said, you came forth with a request and we're helping you with it. And you know the request that I presented before the Lord? I said, Lord, there is a lot that you have revealed to me. I want you to help me calibrate those things in the order of their occurrence. And the Lord is helping me. Now I'm beginning to learn more about the order in which things are unfolding. And it's different from the order in which scripture is compiled, at least in this Bible. And so that's why it throws me off every now and again. So don't think that I forgot scriptures. It's just because I'm receiving the answer to one of my prayers. So Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. I want to read this to you because with much responsibility, I mean with much privilege comes much responsibility. Ha. Ah. Okay. Um, thank you, Jesus. Um, Father, thank you. I want to just say this very quickly. If you have been praying about your divine assignment on this earth, I know that we're saying that the world is about to end. Yes, it's a world system that ends. A government, a, a, a demonic, a satanic hold that has been running our lives since Nimrod is what is about to end, the one world order. The earth continues. So you're not going to escape your assignment of doing what God wants you to do. Every single one of us, we're still going to fulfill all of what God calls us to. So forget about this escapist mentality that the rapture is a way of escaping and leaving everything behind. No, we are not going to escape before the tribulation. Okay, we've read it in scripture. All those people that tell us that, oh, we are pre-trib, oh, we're going to be out of here before the tribulation, they are saying that out of a sympathetic um, interpretation of scripture. They sympathize with humanity that they don't believe that we're going to be here when the tribulation is here. Okay, but what the Bible says is that we will be here in the tribulation so that we can behold the reward of the wicked. The Bible says that the tears, Jesus speaking in Matthew 13, right? In Matthew 13, Jesus says the tears will be taken out of the field before the wheat. So the wheat will be left behind and they will watch the tears being smoked out of existence. You understand what I mean? The tears, rather. The wheat will watch the tears being taken out. And one of the things that Jesus told to the generation of the last days when he was speaking he said, I see a generation that is looking for a sign. He said, but no sign will be given to you except for the sign of Jonah. That was the people, those were the people at the end of his ministry the first time. And then he looked to the ones behind that represented the generation that will be here today. And what did he say to them? He said, but for you, the sign that you will receive is the sign of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the sons of men. And what happened in the days of Noah? Giants were walking the earth. And you have to be living under a rock for you to not know that the giants are back. Physical giants have been caught on camera now and they're not showing them in the news because of fake news, but they're out there. But they can only keep them for so long. Very soon, they will start to show up in more places. As it was in the days of Noah, in the days of Noah, men were getting married to men. It's happening today. Women were getting married to women. It's happening today. People that are not made by God, quote unquote, who were a fabrication of Satan, are mingling with the blood of men, and it's happening again today, just as it happened in the time of Noah. And so we know that Jesus was speaking to this generation who will experience the warnings or the signs of the times of Noah. And what did he say? There was a young man who was standing amongst them. His name was John. And he said to his disciples, when, and he said, what if, what if I told you that that one will be here when I come? 
And we used to wonder, that how is even that going to be possible? John was already a man. How is he going to be here when he comes? Well, let me tell you what John himself said. When John was prophesying, what did he say? He says, I, John, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be with the brethren in the time of tribulation. John himself said it, that it was going to be here. And so if John the beloved is going to be here in the time of tribulation, so where do you think you're escaping to? Where is the plan for escape in the scriptures? The Bible says that we're going to be caught up in the twinkle of an eye. We will be changed and we will join the entourage of Jesus to come back to the earth to take possession of the earth. So don't drop all the visions that God has given to you. The places that you will take the gospel to, you will still take the gospel to it. The Lord has warned me repeatedly about this thing. He said, because there are many of your brethren who are seeing the signs of the end, the falling stars, the cloud of blood and smoke and pillars of fire and, they're, and pillars of smoke and they're saying, oh, the end is here and they're casting off restraint. He says, no, when the end came for me, this was Jesus speaking, what did I do? He said, I doubled up on my effort. I walked more. He said, I must walk the walk of him that sent me for the night comes. When the night comes, we don't chicken, we walk more. Because there is a reward coming and the reward is for the work that you have done. Jesus said, I am coming and my reward is with me. He didn't say my punishment is with me. So forget about, don't get stuck with your weaknesses and your sins. Your sins are forgiven. Focus all your energy on preaching the gospel. For the Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. Daniel chapter 12 says, for those that turn many unto righteousness, they will begin to shine as the stars in the heavens. When they receive their bodies, their bodies will be luminous. Some people will receive their new body and they will look the same. They will look the same, but some of us will look brand new because we will have a glow to us. It's in scripture. And what do you do to earn that? Turn many to righteousness. So don't just receive all these signs. Say something. What do they say out there? If you see something, you say something. And we are seeing the signs and that is the reason why we have to be them that bear the glad tidings. Okay, my wife has texted me six times, so I think I need to, I need to land this plane. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12 verse, six, verse 4. It says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run, tow, and fro, and knowledge shall increase. What did I tell you about going to and fro? Don't join them. Stand your ground because they will put up all kinds of meetings, all kinds of things telling you this is where you need to be. Jesus is here. Don't run to and fro. Then I, Daniel, looked and there stood two others, one on the riverbank on this side and the other on that other side of the river, riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these words be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times and half a time. And then the power of the holy people has been, and what? And when rather, the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. Now this is just a King James issue. The word shattered is the word accomplished. If you look at the original translation, is the word accomplished. When the power of the holy people is accomplished. How do we know that? When you look at the original word, that word translates accomplished, right? But they translated it shattered because in their time, in the 1600s, they would use those words interchangeably. It's just like it is finished. It is also, it is complete. You know, you say something is finished. When, the, when you drink all the water in a cup, you say it is finished. But in the time of Jesus, when you fill up a cup and it is full, you say it is finished. And that was why Jesus says it is finished because his blood had drained to fill the cup of the, of the drink offering that the Lord was waiting for to release salvation. He said it is finished. So when he says it is shattered, it is also accomplished. When John the beloved was quoting this in Revelations 11, what did he say? He was 11 or 13. He was talking about the fact that the beast from the abyss would only come to overpower the witnesses when their power was, is what? Complete. John said when all of our assignment is complete, that's when the end will come. So I don't want you to, because before I learned this thing, I used to be so discouraged whenever I read this scripture that our power should be shattered. We don't even have enough power already. Don't shatter the little we have. I'm still happy to pray for a little headache and have it healed. I'm waiting for the resurrection power to heal, to raise the dead. And now you're saying the little I have, you want to shatter it. No, he says it will be accomplished, okay? So it says... All these things shall be finished. 
when the power is accomplished. Although, verse 8, I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall the end of, what shall be the end of these things? And he said to me, go your way, mind your business. That's what it means, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. That is the reason why we know these things that they did not know. Because it was meant for us. That's why we're called the generation upon whom the end of the ages have come. And they said, sing in righteousness. For they are most blessed of all men upon whom the end of the ages have come. And so verse 9 says, I mean verse 10 says, many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. This is really where I am going. Verse 11. And from that time, the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. This is the same condition for the revealing of the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist will be revealed in the place of what? Of the abomination of desolation. Right? In fact, the presence of the Antichrist is what is called the abomination of desolation. Why is this very important? This is important because of the fact that we have an idea of how long the great tribulation will be. The tribulation itself is total of seven years, but part of that is called the great tribulation. And when it is called the great tribulation, the only way you are going to make it is if you learn how to move in the company of the host of heaven that have been assigned to you and that you have been assigned to. My mission here today is for us to be able to pray together and commit ourselves to the Lord. Because no matter how much information that we can share amongst one another, no matter how much scriptures that we can dig up, we cannot know more scriptures than Jesus himself. The Bible says he is the word of God that became flesh. And we beheld his glory and his glory was as, the, as of the son of God. And what did Jesus himself say when he got to the end of his ministry just before he went to hell? What did he say? He says, Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. And so today we will pray as we break bread that the Lord would allow for us to stay in the company of the angels that have been assigned to see us through this time. When Lot was to be taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he was reluctant because of the possessions that he had. Many of us will not be willing to move in the direction that the Lord is leading simply because of our business, because of our associates, because of our neighbors, because of the commitments to our local church. In some cases, many of us will not be able to move. The angels would have to take us by the hand out of the mercy of God. But when these angels come, they will come as help and you have to behave yourself properly because God warned us concerning his angels. He says, I will send my angel to go before you. Exodus chapter 23 verse 20. He said, I will send my angels before you to help you. And then in verse 21, he says, but be careful not to grieve that angel. He said, because I have put my name on the angel and because of that, he will not forgive. And that was what Jesus was also talking about, saying every blasphemy against the Father is forgiven, against the Son is forgiven, which is literally overlooked. He said, but blasphemy against the Spirit, you will be held accountable. You cannot get away with it. And so what does that mean? We have come to that time that Paul was speaking about when he wrote to the Romans, to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, we have enjoyed the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, but we must remain in sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit. If the fellowship with the Holy Spirit is not sweet, these angels are operating as delegates of the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you. What did I start this message with before I went down all my conspiracy theory rabbit trails? I told you at the beginning that we have come to a time wherein we have to be extra sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying, wherein we have to be in full cooperation with the angels of the Lord. And let me tell you something, we need to walk with our hands, our heads looking up. Let us stand up for a moment as we begin to take this confession. But I want to beg you, this is perhaps one of the most important things that I've said to you from this pulpit ever. And so please, I want you to pay attention. And if this is the first time you're hearing me preach, I don't usually preach this long. All the time. And, that's, and it's not always this convoluted. Alrighty. But the reason why I'm doing this today is because the Lord has given me the authority to speak deep unto deep. You know, the Bible says deep calls to deep. And so some of the things that I am saying, I am saying from my spirit to your spirit. And so it doesn't have to make 
sense here as much because the Bible says when I am in the spirit, the understanding profits little. So I'm speaking to you in the spirit, even though it sounds like I'm speaking the language of men. You are the one hearing me in English, but I am speaking in the spirit. Because the Bible says in the day of the outpouring of his spirit, what happened? They heard him in their language. But the truth of the message is coming from spirit to spirit. Remember what we just read in Daniel chapter 12. I read over it very quickly, but I want you to go and listen to it again. There are two witnesses and they're on different sides of the river, but their deeps are calling to deep. So I am that angel, that linen, that guy in, in linen on one side. You are the other one on the other side. And the message of the Lord to me, to you, is very clear to your spirit. So don't leave here feeling like, oh my God, what did I subject myself to? I could have been at a kebab place eating and watching television. Why did I listen to this guy? What was all this about? Don't worry about it. Your spirit has been done a great favor by the Lord. So let us all give thanks to God. Alrighty. So this is what I want to say very quickly. I'm speaking quickly now because of time. We have come to a time wherein we have to be dependent on the angels. We don't preach the worship of angels here, but we make use of our angels. The Bible says that the Lord has given to us his angels as ministering spirits to those of us that will inherit the land, as heirs, those who are heirs of salvation, right? So if you are going to inherit, you need to follow the angels. I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, why? Why is it so important at this time? He took me to a place and he says, watch carefully and, and take notes. And what did he show me? I saw a man of God. Okay, I'll just tell you, I saw myself. Because sometimes, sometimes I try to be too humble and then I get you confused. It was me. I saw myself. I was dressed in burlap, right? I was dressed in burlap and I was walking, let me describe it to you. I was walking like this. And I was like, what is that about? And he said to me, what did I tell you? He said, I told you that when you see these things, look up. I said, oh, he said, your spirit gets it. It understands the assignment. You're supposed to look up. He said, but if you're looking up, how do you ensure that you don't stumble? He says the angels have been given that assignment. The Bible says he has given his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against a stone. If I'm walking and looking around, I'm not going to dash my foot against a stone. The reason why I need them to guide my foot is because my eyes are on the Lord, the author and the finisher of my faith. You need the angels of the Lord. If you noticed, which I hope you didn't because you're supposed to be worshiping while we were worshiping, I knelt here and I had my hands up in the same posture for minutes without end. If you've ever worn a fitted blazer that makes you look like you're not fat, you know what I mean. It's not easy to raise your hand. The blazer will be pulling back at you. But I felt no pressure because my hand was being held up by the angels. I stood here, my hands were being held up by the angels whose feet did not touch the ground. And I could feel their motion because it would go forward and come back as they levitated above the ground, go forward and come back. And the Lord says to me, you have the sign, today you release the message. This is the time for you to engage the ministry of the angels if you do not want to stumble, if you do not want to dash your foot against the stone. The very last minds in this field that is called the world system is already been put out by Satan. Satan will cause many people to trip by things in the news, by policies that have been made, by decisions. Let me tell you something. Some people will cry and curse God when they wake up and they don't have money in their bank account anymore. Not because they didn't put money there, but because the system is hijacked. They will say that it's hijacked, but it's the same people. But what I'm telling you is this. If you wake up and they said, oh, people are not able to withdraw their money from the bank. Lift up your hands and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because there is nothing any man has that he has not received from above. Like Job says, naked did I come into this world and naked would I return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You need to divorce your heart from mammon because mammon is falling. But if you don't know, you will stumble because you will use your mouth to say there's a casting down. You don't want to be that believer who says that we are doomed. It must not come out of your mouth because the way the Lord has given his angels charge over you, Satan has also assigned his goons waiting for you to slip up by saying what you shouldn't. And they will immediately call you out and then I say, you are not supposed to say that. You have played into our hands. So I want to encourage you, I beg you in the name of the Lord. This is the biggest challenge of the Exodus. 
The reason why Lot's wife did not make it out of Sodom and Gomorrah was because she couldn't divorce herself from the possession. Don't let your words draw you back. They that know their God will be strong and they will do exploit. And so I want you to lift up your voice and say, I will speak only life. I will be ministered to by the angels. So that I don't stumble. I will lift up my eyes to the Lord. And I will not be distracted from him. The Lord is the glory and the lifter of my head. When I lift my head, it is not by my own power. It is by his enablement. And I will keep looking until I see the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, very good. Praise the Lord. I want to pray for somebody here. Someone very close to you, like a family member, has accused you of the same thing again and again. And you wonder where it's coming from. I see you saying, I don't know where that is coming from. And the Lord is saying, you need to be prayed for today because a part of you is beginning to believe it. And I want to pray for you today to silence the echoes in the walls of your heart of an accusation, accusation that is contrary to what the Lord has said about you. Please do not leave this place without having that voice silenced. Because that person did not speak of themselves, they spoke as Satan gave them utterance. They spoke like when Peter said to Jesus, you're not gonna die. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, O Satan. And so I want you to think about it properly. I don't wanna call you out, I want you to come out. But someone has said certain things to you, like an ac accusation. They just say it and you're like, that's not me, I don't do that, that's not who I am, that's not what I'm about. But a part of you is beginning to believe it subconsciously. I wanna pray for you today so that you are at peace and the enemy doesn't use that occasion to rob you of your joy. So come up very quickly, let me pray for you. I wanna pray for a few other people, so let's get it done. So I want you to come right now so that I can pray for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Alrighty. I want you to think about it because ah, uh, Father, I thank you. There's another reason why you should come here, but I want you to come here first. And so if anyone that you know very close to you, think about it properly. It's a very subtle attack of the enemy. They have said certain things, and it's like, yeah, that's not me. Why would they even say that? But a part of you is beginning to register it. By the laying on of hands, it will be broken off of you. The choice is yours. You can go back home, and deal with it, and you can have it all, you can have it dealt with right here. The choice is yours. Alan, let me pray for you. While I wait for this person, I'm gonna give you like a few more minutes to decide if you wanna come out or not. It's very simple what I saw. The finger of the Lord rebuked the ones who have come after you and told them to go back. You see what I mean? They've come after you, they have even scaled fences, and every fence that they scaled was revealed to me to be a generation. So they will scale from one generation into another, into another. And now the Lord has rebuked them. And very soon you will see that the things that you would almost receive that would not materialize will now materialize almost as if it's like, even if I don't want it, it's right here. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for so shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want you to tell Franca, this is for my wife Rosemary, tell your sister Franca that the ones who have been waiting for an update have now heard the voice of the Lord and they will move even without the updates of men. You see, the, what they are waiting for, this is concerning the building, what they are waiting for, tell Franca, what they are waiting for, even before it materializes, the Lord has spoken to the ones who need to move and they will begin to move. I hear that there is finality. It is going to be made complete it is going to be made complete in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, I'm praying for somebody. Is there somebody here who is about to start a different business other than the one that they're doing? There's a business that you're doing and you're thinking, okay, maybe I'm going to try something else. I want to start a different business. Alrighty, I'm going to pray for you anyway because there's no time to wait for people to decide if they want to come or not. This is what the Lord said to me. He said to me to tell you that you haven't finished the one you're doing. 
He says, you need to stay because there is not enough time for you to start that new one while this harvest is pending. Stay and receive the harvest. I know you have made plans. I know you have paid money. The Lord is saying to you, put it on hold and finish the one that you are doing. But you're saying, Lord, I've done everything that I know how to do. The Lord says to finish a thing is not just to keep doing. Part of finishing a thing is waiting to receive the part that the Lord has done. So wait, and when it comes, it will bring to you that which you're about to chase using this other venture. The Lord is going to bring it to you. And this last word is for everybody that is present in here and for those that will watch it later. I want to say to you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will be Daniel in this generation. Amen. We are in the generation of Laodicea. Laodicea means the judgment of the people and it is the seventh church or the seventh ecclesia. And the Lord is calling you to be a Daniel simply because you are not meant to run by the judgment of people, but you are meant to run by the judgment of God. And the word Daniel means God is my judge. And so I want to encourage you, profess this often, and say to yourself that I am Daniel. The Lord is my judge. I am Daniel. The Lord is my judge. In Jesus' name. Let us sit down and break bread together, and I'm going to tell you about that little prayer that we just said now. And we're going to be out of here. And um, I'm not going to um, kid us by telling us that this will not happen again because there's a lot to talk about, there's a lot to pray about that we might be spending a little bit more time here. And so please, don't stay away because it's long. Make plans around it because we need to be in this presence. In 2020, what did I tell us? I asked the Lord, I said in Hebrews 10, 25, you said do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves especially as the manner of some is. And what did the Lord say to me that I said to you? He says, when we gather together like this, he says our collective presence creates such an open portal that allows for every angel that needs to be in the room to be able to make it into the room. And that's why Paul says that others may be deceived, but those of us who come together like this will not be deceived and we will not be discouraged. It's there in Hebrews chapter 10. So I want to encourage you, these meetings are very critical. Okie dokie. Praise God. So Father, in Jesus' name, let us lift up the bread and the wine and do as Jesus said, declare the bread, the body of Jesus, and the wine, the blood of Jesus. And we do this, Lord, in remembrance of you. We're called to remembrance every force that governs life that is within us to be, remember, I mean, to be reminded duly that it was for us that Jesus died, that we may live the glorified life. We eat of your body and drink of your blood in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to hand off to, uh, um, to Alan very soon just to close us out. But in the meantime, there is, a, there is a, not a final warning, but one more word um, that I have to deliver to us. I beg of you in the mighty name of Jesus. Be mindful of the ones who are coming to share in your oil. Don't just pray with everybody who comes. And do not just pray for everybody who asks. And the reason why I'm saying that is this. Jesus was very generous with the anointing until he came to John 17. Before that time, Jesus would pray just like general prayers, almost like all men. But when he came to John 17, he says, I no longer pray for the world. He said, but I pray for these ones. A time is coming wherein if you decide to join hands to pray for everybody, the enemy will use several opportunities to deplete you of oil. You are the five, you are of the five wise virgins who said to the foolish ones, if we share our oil with you, it will not be enough. You go buy yours. We're good the way we are. Train your wick. Okay? Because the devil is not short of people who are dead weights who would want to come and sap your power and at the same time they're going nowhere. They are tears. Their, their, their path is already set. 
But you are the target. You are the ones that they want to derail. So make sure that when they come to you and say, oh, can you join us for this one hour prayer meeting? We want to pray for this thing. Ask the Holy Spirit, are they for me or against me? Ask the Holy Spirit, do I go or do I not go? Let me tell you something. And if you do not hear go, don't assume the Lord is saying go. You are better off conserving your energy. People will ask you to pray for all kinds of things. I told you, was it on Tuesday, that the old world was praying for a young man who fell on the football field, but it was a deception. Because the boy was part of a satanic initiation, but everybody, even news anchors, you know, everybody, presenters were praying. They were praying. Because the Bible says that the wicked also prays. Have you not read in scriptures where it says that the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God? We cannot pray without being led by the Holy Spirit because whatever we do that is not by faith, it is a sin because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Do nothing out of faith, do not, I mean, out of fear, do nothing out of ignorance. You have to understand what you're doing and you have to have heard the Lord. The Lord is saying that because of the fact that you need to conserve energy. The days ahead are long. God be with you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give God a shout of praise for what he's done with us tonight. Hallelujah. We're going to make our way. The offering basket is here. We have envelopes if you need that to prepare for offering. And uh, just as we were encouraged uh, recently, we know the Lord has shortened the time, and there's a lot going into these messages. It's a lot that we're receiving. But I want to share with us one nugget that has helped me to really bring the messages home. When you come into the sanctuary to hear the message, come with, it, come, uh, with a posture of titling the message. Okay, I've heard this. What would I title what I've just heard? It helps you stay in that posture of active listening so you can really be uh, 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 just interpreting, discerning what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. So come in with that posture. What is the theme here? Okay, so I want to help us with that. I want to give us a couple more seconds to prepare our offering, and we will pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. There's none like you, O oh God. Truly, we are in your presence, O oh God. For your word declares where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Father, we thank you for this move, O oh God, of your glory in this house, how you have ministered to us, O oh God, by your servant, by your angelic, and Lord, how you have ministered deep unto deep. Father, let these offerings, O oh God, be pleasing in your sight. These offerings of worship unto you. Father, we thank you for we live by faith. For we know it is impossible to please you except by faith. And Lord, what you have given us, Lord, we give back unto you as a sign knowing that you provide all. Lord, all glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This broadcast will be live tomorrow, so make sure you check it out on YouTube, and we'll be right back on Tuesday, 6.30, Family Dinner and Teaching Tuesday. If you haven't been yet, we come, we chop it up, we eat first, and then we're coming to the sanctuary, and we go from there. I give God praise for you all. Y'all have a blessed night. <laughs>